I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Once again, welcome to Grace. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend, wherever you're joining us from, whether online or at any of our campuses. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here. And we're continuing this week in a series called The Apostles' Creed, a series that's based on this ancient creed put together by uh, church leaders from hundreds of years ago where they collected these truths that are foundational to our faith. And they said it's good that we would remember these, recite these, dwell upon these truths. And, and here at Grace in 2020, we're saying the same thing. It's good that we would put this in front of us and keep this in front of us because there's real value in this. It's not scripture. It's not magic, but it is really valuable because, if you'll look in your notes, it's really valuable because of this. It points to the purpose of the Christian life and the power to live it. It points us to the purpose of the Christian life and the power to live it. It reminds us of what we're supposed to be about as Christians and keeps us tethered to those truths. But not only that, it reminds us where we go, as we'll see today, to find the strength to be able to live those things out. Now, the topic that we're talking about today is one probably of all the things we've talked about in the creed so far, uh, where we might come to this from, from the, the most vastly differing perspectives. And depending on what your background or your experience has been with this, you might be really excited to hear about this, kind of nervous to hear about this, wondering what on earth this is even about. Because here's what's true as we talk about the topic to today of the Holy Spirit. Here's what's true of us. Depending on your background, the emphasis on the Holy Spirit that, that you come from may have been a lot, a little, or honestly a bit weird. Depending on your background, the, the emphasis on the Holy Spirit, the things that you've been taught may have been a lot, a little, or a bit weird. So maybe it was a lot. Maybe you come from a background where that was a part of a lot of conversations. Are we listening to the Spirit? Is that person really being guided by the Spirit? Do I see a demonstration of the supernatural power of the Spirit? Are we leaving room for the Spirit to move? And maybe that was a consistent piece of conversations. And you hear we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and you're like, yeah, Grace is bringing out the big guns. Finally, Pastor Keith read my email. Now we're getting to it. Maybe you come from a place where actually this was something that was talked about very little, maybe even not at all. And so your concept of the Holy Spirit might be kind of close to like my concept of my appendix. Like it, it's there, I know it's there, I'm not sure what it does, wouldn't want to lose it, but I, I have no idea what it does or if my life is actually better with it. Or maybe you come from a place where you haven't heard really anything about this at all and, and so you're saying, man, I don't know. I feel kind of ignorant. I feel kind of like a rookie on the topic. Or maybe you're coming from a place where honestly your exposure to this has been a little bit weird. There's some people who come to this topic with some spiritual and emotional baggage and, and you say, I've been in spaces where I felt uncomfortable and it was off-putting and, and you're thinking, if he brings out snakes on stage tonight, I'm out of here. Like, you're thinking, man, if this goes, like, I invited a friend to watch this online. I, I invited, so don't scare him off. But no matter where you're coming from today as it pertains to the topic of the Holy Spirit, my, my goal is that we would get on the same page and be able to understand together who he is, what he does, and why that matters for us today. To begin to do that, I want to put on kind of the, the educational hat for just a moment here. And I want to take us to kind of Holy Spirit 101. And so there, there are whole seminary courses dedicated to the topic of learning about the study of the Holy Spirit. It's called pneumatology. 
comes from the Greek word pneuma, which means wind or air. It's where we get the idea of pneumatic things, like those pneumatic tubes at the bank where you, you know, or pneumonia has to do with wind or air. And so there are metaphors that, that Jesus uses and we see in scripture for the Holy Spirit. You, you can't see him, but you can see where he's been and you can see where he's moving, kind of like the wind, kind of like the air. And so that Greek word pneuma and uh, pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. But I, I wanna get us on the same page here with the definition of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Spirit. Trinity. Trinity is not a word that's actually mentioned in Scripture, but again and again we see in Scripture that there is a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit, three distinct persons, all one triune God. He is personal. He's a person. He's not a force. He, he's not a concept. He's not an idea. He's not just the power of God. He's personal. And we see in scripture that the Holy Spirit has uh, emotions. He has a will. He can be grieved. He speaks. He instructs. He directs. He's a person. And he's also fully God. Fully God. Co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is fully God, to be worshiped, to be recognized and revered, to be obeyed. The Holy Spirit does things only God can do. He had a part in creation. And the Holy Spirit had a part in the, the, the virgin birth of Jesus. The Holy Spirit moved events in history to move things along throughout uh, the decades. And the Holy Spirit is the one who brings new life to the Christian and is the conduit for everything that happens in the Christian's life as the Christian relates to God. And, and all of these different things, and we're gonna get to some of these things in this talk that the Holy Spirit specifically does, all of his kind of specific actions, they all culminate in one thing, and that is that the role and the function of the Holy Spirit is to shine a spotlight on the work of Jesus and on the worth of Jesus. That everything the Holy Spirit does and all the ways that he interacts with people and throughout history is to shine a spotlight on the work of Jesus and the work uh, and the worth of Jesus. Okay, seminary hat off, back to church. And here's the question that we're asking ourselves probably this weekend. Like, that's great, that was a lot of facts, that, that's a cool bit of education, but why should I care? Why should that matter for me? How does that impact my life? I want to tell you uh, just real quick, my, um, my daughter is 16 years old, and uh, we're having such a fun time with her right now as she's kind of sneaking towards adulthood. Like I had her at the bank the other day, and she got a debit card and opened an account. She, she went out today with some friends, and she was like, this is going to be my first time using my debit card, and I'm, I'm nervous about it, you know? She's, she is uh, feeling, she, she's got a job, and she's learning how to work. Uh, we're teaching her how to drive, and she's getting into, like, the scarier things, like, you know, faster-moving highways and the freeway and things like that. She feels these pressures from school and from other things to start thinking about a career path and what she needs to be doing with her schooling to be making choices. And the closer she inches toward this great, big, scary world, the more actual fear and insecurity she feels and the sense of incompetence. And she said to me, I don't, I don't know if I feel big enough, strong enough, smart enough to be able to do all this. Dad, did you ever feel that way? When you were a kid, I was like, no. I said, baby, I felt that way last week, right? I, I felt that way last week. As I look at our world and the way things are changing and what I used to think I understood, I don't really understand anymore. And there's pressure and I, I want to provide for my family and I want to make them happy and I want to succeed at work. And there are people who are depending on me and there's things I don't understand. And sometimes adulting still feels beyond me. And I feel like I don't know if I'm strong enough. I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I'm big enough. I know you feel this too. If you're a parent, I know you feel this. As you're thinking, whatever that next announcement from the governor and what it means for school and what that might mean for you, I don't know if I'm strong enough. I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I can handle what the world's gonna throw at me and the demands that are placed on me. In your relationships, maybe in your marriage, 
in those times that it really tests you to your core and you go, I don't know that I've got what's being demanded of me here. When you look in the mirror and you, you, you see something that's uglier than it looked a few months ago because, man, this world has been hard on our souls lately. You go, man, I thought I'd be moving forward differently. I didn't think I'd see the things I see in myself. And, and I don't know if I've got what it takes to be able to turn this around or meet the demands or be able to do the things that are expected of me. Here's what I want to say to us all, wherever you're joining us from. If you've got the question in your soul of, I don't know if I've got what it takes, I want you to listen to this. You don't have what it takes. You don't have what it takes. Now, if you're, don't turn me off online right now. Don't, don't get up and leave the room right now. Because some things get better about this. But, but I want us to understand, Christian or not a Christian, if you're going to fulfill God's purpose for your life, if you're going to actually live in the fullness of everything that you've been created to do, in and of yourself, here's the truth, you don't have what it takes. The demands on you are greater than what is in you to be able to do it. And as a Christian, particularly, let's add on to all those other things, like you're expected to live a lifestyle of radical generosity, reflect Jesus to the world, right? Be a light that shines in the darkness, bring justice and hope and healing to places that need it, because that's what Christians do. So let's add all of that on top of it. And I think there's this honest moment for everybody who calls themselves a Christian where we have to come to grips with the reality we don't have what it takes to be able to do what God wants us to do. I've felt that, you've felt that. And, and here's what I wanna share this weekend is there's a group of Jesus' closest followers. I'm not talking about people who just showed up for like a free miracle every now and then. Like the closest followers who were with Jesus for years who had a moment when they were saying, I don't know that I have what it takes to do what God is asking us to do. So we're going to take a look at that right now and take a look at the incredible news that Jesus gives them in that moment of desperation. So I want you to grab your Bibles, if you would, and, and, and open up to John chapter 14. John 14, we're going to have you go to verse 15. If you don't have a Bible and you're in one of our physical locations right after the service, if you would stop by Grace Central, we would love to give you a Bible for free. John chapter 14, and, and I want you just to hold there because I'm gonna jump to a, to a different passage and then we're gonna uh, join with you. These are two different places in the Bible where Jesus is having the same conversation with his disciples. And the conversation kind of goes like this. Um, okay, I'm gonna be uh, dying soon. They're gonna crucify me and I'm gonna be buried and I'm gonna rise again. And then I'm going to leave. Now, love each other as I have loved you. Turn the world upside down. You're going to do greater things even than what you've seen me do. I'm counting on you guys. I'm going to leave now. And Jesus' disciples hear him say, here's all these things I want you to do. And I want you to continue to turn the world around. And I'm leaving. And they're going, you're leaving? Like we're going to be on our own? We're, this is all going to be up to us. I don't know that I have what it takes. I don't think we're strong enough, big enough, smart enough to be able to do that, Jesus. So I'm going to jump into John 16 here and just show you a little bit of a preview of some of this conversation. So Jesus is talking to them. He gets to the end of a little bit of this talk. He goes, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Like, I just told you I was going to be, like, resurrected, go to heaven, and you're not going like, wow, that's awesome. How's that work? You're not going like, so you're really leaving the planet? You're not even saying, I hope you have a great trip, Jesus. None of you are even talking about that part. Instead, you're filled with grief because I've said these things. You're freaking out over the, he says, I, I'm reading the temperature of the room as I'm talking to you, and he says, I can just tell you're, you're reeling. You're on your heels thinking, you're going to leave us, Jesus, and we're going to be all on our own, and what are we going to do? And so he then begins to say some things that are intended to bring them comfort, and he says this, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. 
Now at this point, I just kind of imagine in the room, like one of the disciples, like, um, excuse me, Jesus? Like, yes, Matthew, go ahead. Um, when we were at the temple and the Pharisees came and they started trying to say things to trap us and then you kind of stepped up and you pants the Pharisees in front of everybody, like that was really good. When we were on that one hill and there were 5,000 people there and they were all hungry and then you were like, give me a lunch, I'm gonna pray, boom, 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 leftovers after everybody was full, that was really good. You remember that party, that one wedding, Jesus, where there was no wine, we ran out of wine, you said bring me some water, all of a sudden the best wine ever, like that was really good, okay? But I do not understand how you going away and leaving us alone. Like Jesus, the miracle worker, Jesus, the, the, the wise one, the mic dropper, Jesus is going away, and you say that's for our good? I don't get it. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. And Jesus is about to tell them there's actually something better. Listen to this. There's actually something better for you than to have Jesus with you. There is actually something better for the Christian than to have Jesus walking right beside you. And here's what he says that it is. He says, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. He says, there's this other person. There's this other part of the equation that if I don't go away, the advocate won't come to you. But if I go, here's what's gonna be better for you. I will send him to you. This word advocate means someone whose job is to help, someone who's called in to be a helper, an aide, a supporter, a counselor, a comforter. Jesus is saying, actually, I want to tell you something. It is better for you that I leave, even as great as it is to be with me and walk with me. And as many things as I did while I was with you, there's something even better than having me with you. And I call him the advocate, and he's the helper, and I'm gonna send him to you. Now let's go to John chapter 14 where, where you've been holding, and we're gonna pick up, again, same conversation, and Jesus is saying, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Now, first of all, I want us to notice real quick here, this is one of the times in scripture when we see the Trinity all represented. Jesus saying, I will ask the Father, and the Father will send you another advocate, the Holy Spirit. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all here together in one sentence in Scripture. But he says, I'll send you another advocate. The same in essence, the same in mission as me, another one. And, and Jesus says, in the same way that I've been with you, guiding you, helping you fulfill your purpose, now somebody else is going to come, another one, another advocate to help you do that. He says, I'm sending him to, to you to help you, meaning you need help. Meaning Jesus is going, I understand you, you don't have what it takes. You can't do it on your own. And I've got that covered because I'm sending this advocate to help you and be with you forever. Jesus says, you need help. The same kind of help that I've given you. But here's the difference. I'm getting ready to leave, but this advocate will never leave. He will be with you forever. And he calls him the spirit of truth. And then we continue into the next verse. He says, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. The world, ungodly, carnal people, they don't have a connection with this Holy Spirit. They don't have a connection with this advocate. They don't get to benefit from that help and that comfort and that guidance and all of those things. But he says, but you know him. You, Christian, you, disciple, you, follower of Jesus and if you're at our campuses or online and you're a Christian and you have a personal relationship with Jesus then I'm talking to you Jesus says you know this advocate you know him and then he continues to flesh this out for he lives with you this word for lives is a word that means like to dwell, to inhabit, to, to make his home there. He says, Jesus is like, when I've been with you for these last three years, like I've been living out of a suitcase, he's going to take his clothes, he's going to put them in the dresser. He's going to be with you to stay. He's going to put the family photos on the wall. He's going to plant a garden because he is here to stay. He's going to make himself at home here. He's going to dwell with you. He's going to live with you. And then he moves on and he says something even more amazing. He says he will live with you and he will be, read this with me, in you. 
he will be in you. Now, I know here we are in 2020 and we've probably, if you're a Christian and read the Bible or been exposed to this, you've probably heard this at different times, but I want you to take yourself back to this moment and realize that never before had a concept like this been said to human ears, God will be in you. God will be in you. You, like they've heard some things before about the Holy Spirit and what he does. And, and the idea was that it, at different times, the Holy Spirit would pick a specific person because of a job that needed done and he would be with him and he would empower him and then he would go. So it was temporary and it was specific and it was with, but Jesus is not with in. Not temporary, permanent, not just one of you, all of you. God will be in you. I am sending the advocate and he will live with you and be in you. There's this Christian concept called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit where at the moment of salvation, the Spirit of God makes his permanent residence in the body of the believer. God is in you. The idea in the Old Testament was that if you wanted to find the presence of God or be near the presence of God, you had to go to the temple. In the New Testament, we are told, Christian, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God is in you. Because the presence of God is living in you. And Jesus is saying to these guys, look, I know the world is big and scary. I know you feel like you don't have what it takes to meet the demands, but I am giving you a gift that no matter how hard things get, how scary things get, listen, I'm not just going to be there for you. I'm not just going to be there with you. I'm telling you, God is going to be in you. I'm leaving, but I'm giving you a gift that's even better than me being with you. And it is this gift right here, friends. It is that the helper has made his home in you. Jesus says, I'm giving you a gift that's even better than me walking beside you. The helper has made his home in you. Not take a number and wait your turn like when you're at the BMV. No, he's with you, unlimited, consistent, uninterrupted access to the presence of God. Not a Zoom call where it's like we're sort of with each other but not really with each other. No, he's with you, he's in you, he is right there with you. Not a thing that, that, that ebbs and flows depending on your feelings. Because the way this got established is Jesus says, I'm sending him and he's going to be with you. And he's going to be in you. The helper has made his home in you. Two things as we think about this idea that God has sent the Holy Spirit, the advocate, to come and to help. Because you didn't have what it takes And he knew that. And he said, I'm going to send the helper who's going to be with you and be in you. Two things for us to think about as we think about that reality. First one is this, his purpose. So Jesus said, I'm leaving. The disciples freaked out. How are we supposed to do what you've wanted us to do all by ourselves? Jesus says, you won't be all by yourself. I'm sending the advocate. He's gonna be with you. The helper has made his home in you and he will help you fulfill his purpose. He's not just being with you to be with you. He's being with you to help you fulfill his purpose. I um, hired somebody recently to come help me out in in my home. We were getting some things ready in our house and we had a deadline. I needed some uh, drywall holes patched. I needed some things painted. I needed some things washed. I needed some things moved in. And I looked at the job and I was pretty overwhelmed. So I got some help. And so a helper came to my house to help me out with those things. And, and, And when this young man was there, there were, there were two things that happened. Number one, I felt relief because I didn't have to do it on my own. I looked at this big daunting thing and I realized I don't have to do this on my own. But number two, his very presence in my home was a reminder there's work to do. Like it's not that he came over and I was like, hey, great, you're here. You want some nachos? Have you seen this movie yet? He was there, but he was there for a purpose. 
Jesus is saying, I have sent the Holy Spirit to you and I have sent him for a purpose. And the presence of God in you, we always need Christians to stay connected. The presence of God in you is connected to God's purpose for you. He's present with you. Why? Because you need help. Why do you need help? Because there's work to be done. What's the work that needs done? It's the same thing the Holy Spirit always does. Shine a spotlight on the work and the worth of Jesus Christ. And as the Christian, Jesus has said, I am sending you the helper to help you glorify God and shine a spotlight on the work and the worth of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm here with you. The, 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 the helper has made his home in you. Why? To help you become more like Christ. To help you lead your family to Christ. To help you point the world to Christ. To help you bring peace and justice and love and mercy to places that don't have it. Would we just wake up every day and realize that the fact that God is present with us should number one, give us incredible relief. We don't have to do things on our own, but number two would give us a reminder. There's work to do. God goes to the office with you because God has work to do at the office. And it's more than just balancing the end of quarter accounts and having the planning meeting. God's got work to do at the office and so he's present with you there. He's present with you in your family, in your circles of friends, in your marriage because God has work to do there. He has a purpose for you. That's why the helper has made his home in you. For the Christian, we must remain committed to his purpose. The Christian has to remember there, there, there's a what and it's the purpose of God, but there, there's also a how. And that leads us to number two because the how is the power of God. The helper has made his home in you and, and we need to think about what that means for the fact that the power of God lives in each and every one of us. Because Jesus said, he's gonna be the one to teach you. He's gonna be the one to remind you. He's gonna be the one to help you and advise and support and all of these things. The disciples are saying, Jesus, you're going away. We can't do this on our own strength. Jesus says, it's not on your own strength. And you're wrong if you think it is. I had a friend tell me about a time when when he was about 16 years old, he had gotten a job, made enough money, like bought himself a pair of shoes and maybe a pair of jeans, and he was, he was feeling pretty proud of himself. He was feeling like a big boy. And he got kind of sassy with his mom, like a little too big for his britches, because he was thinking, I'm, I'm an adult now, and I can take care of myself and all of this stuff now. And mom sat him down for a little talking to. And she said, listen, you, you need to understand I'm the one who buys your clothes, I buy your food, I pay for the bills, I keep the gas on, the water on, the sewer on, the electric on. When you get sick, I, I find out what's wrong, I take you to the doctor, I pick up the prescription, I help you take the meds. When you fall behind in your schoolwork, I connect you to your teacher, I help you catch up on your assignments. When, when you forget things, I help you remember them so you don't go to school looking like an idiot. Um, when things break in our house, I fix them. There's stuff you don't even know about because I protect you from it all the time. So go ahead and tell me again just how big and strong and independent you are and how you're doing everything on your own. Christians, I think maybe we need a little talking to and a reminder from the Holy Spirit because I think a lot of us have come to the point in our forgetfulness where, where we just forget how reliant we are all the time on the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit would sit us down and give us a talking to, he might say, listen, I'm the one who drew you to Jesus in the first place. I'm the one who indwells you and fills your life with the presence of God. I'm the one who positionally places you in Christ. I'm the one who walks with you through this sanctification process of your life, making you more and more like Jesus all the time. I'm the one who gives you assurance of your salvation. I'm the one who makes scripture make sense to you as I illuminate those things. I help you pray. And when you can't pray, I pray for you because I know you better than anybody else knows you. 
I walk with you through every step of your life. I, I guide you. I help you understand the will of God for your life. I give you spiritual gifts so that you can help other people and build up the church and glorify God. I bring into your life the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's all from me. I convict you so that you don't lose fellowship with God. I empower you to be able to love and do good deeds, and I've sealed you. So that throughout your whole life, you're going to get to the end because I've got you. And I'm going to deliver you to the Father at the end of this. And when your life on earth is over, I'm going to set you up for eternal life with him. Now tell me again how this is about you and your strength and what you can and cannot do. Right? Because the Holy Spirit is the power that fills the life of the believer. And yet some of you think and live like you're supposed to do this all in your own strength. No wonder you're frustrated. No wonder you're tired. No wonder you feel like you're failing the pressure you put on yourself, this self-reliance to live the Christian life in your own strength apart from the power of God. There's a, a writer, somebody who did a great deal of good in this world. Her name's Corrie Ten Boom, and and she rescued Jews in Nazi Germany by hiding them in her home. And she writes, trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. All the power in your life to live for God comes from God, living in and through you. You don't have what it takes, but the helper has made his home in you. And for the Christian, winning doesn't look like trying harder. Winning looks like recognizing the power of God and relying on the power of God. God, in this temptation in my life that I can't seem to overcome, I recognize that your power is in me and I'm going to rely on your power. So you move, so you work. God, in in my marriage, somebody's got to go first and I think it needs to be me. So I'm going to recognize your power, not my power. And I'm going to rely on your power. God, my friend needs to hear about Jesus. And so it has to be your power. God, this person is really hard to love. And so I, it has to be your power. God, I don't know how I'm going to be able to make this bold decision. And I'm leaning into you and I'm recognizing and relying on your power because the helper has made his home in me. I don't have to do this in my own power. The helper's made his home in you. You don't have to do this in your own power. Listen, you don't have what it takes in and of yourself. But the helper has made his home in you and the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and you have access to the power of God and in him you do have what it takes. No matter what it is, You have what it takes to fulfill the purposes that God places in front of you because God's power is unlimited. And he lives in you. Want to be careful just to make sure that we understand as Christians that that this this is not just something that happens on its own, but that the Holy Spirit actually enters our life as a helper and as, as a partner. Like if I, if I told you, hey guys, good news, I hired a personal trainer, still waiting for my abs to all of a sudden change and look completely different, you'd be like, ah, I'm pretty sure there's something you need to do. And I think a lot of us could, could, could come away from a talk like this thinking that the simple presence of the Holy Spirit must mean that all the good stuff is gonna happen as a result of it. But here's what I think we all should understand is that your level of progress as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, depends on your level of partnership with the helper, with the Holy Spirit. Your level of progress depends on your level of partnership. And if you've ever been a coach or a teacher or a mentor, you get this. It's like, I'm here to help you, but you have to listen to me. I'm here to help you, but you have to follow what I say to do. I'm here to help you, but we've got to have a partnership here. And you've got to listen and you've got to go along with me. I want to remind all of us that even though the helper has made his home in you, it's possible, Christians, to do what the Bible calls quenching the spirit 
To quench the spirit is to say, I'm going to resist or deny the things that God is at work in my life about. I'm, I'm going to go through my life like this, la, 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 and I don't want to hear it, and I don't want to do it, and I'm resisting it, and I'm pushing against it. We can quench the spirit by repeatedly saying, I don't want that. I'm going to fight against it. I'm not going to listen, and I'm not going to follow. I would just refer us back to something we said a few minutes ago in this talk. You don't have what it takes. You quench the spirit and don't rely on his power and don't move into his purpose, then you're just left with you and good luck with that. Good luck with your own strength, your own wisdom, your own power, your own ability. No, the helper has made his home in you. And so for, for us, for Christians... The move, again, is not to try harder, do more. The the move is to say, I'm going to yield. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to listen. I'm going to obey. I'm going to follow. Now, what what does that look like in real time? I think because if if we were to say, what is listening to the Holy Spirit, what is that like for you? We'd probably get a lot of different versions of that. For some people, they go, well, well, I get these really clear words from God that this is what I'm supposed to do. Other people go, God's not that chatty with me. Other people would say, sometimes it's just this like, I feel like a weight is on me. I feel like there's something that's just pushing against her, like a warning bell's going off or something. I feel like I've got a, a burden or an inkling. And how do we take that and how do we turn that into to real-time listening and following? I think the first thing is to know that, that some things we have to wonder whether that's really from God and, and some things we don't. Like honestly, if you hear a word or get an inkling or, or see a sign or something like that and it's something about forgiving somebody, it's probably from the Holy Spirit, do it. If it's something about being kind and generous and representing Jesus well, I'm guessing that's from the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and do that one. If it's something about fixing something in your life that's making your testimony look bad and taking away from your ability to shine a spotlight on the work and worth of Christ, that's from the Holy Spirit. Listen and do it. Other things are a little more fuzzy and you're like, I'm not sure. Am I hearing this? Is this really what this is being said? And in those cases, we say, man, I'm gonna gonna test it against what I know in scripture. And I'm gonna look and I'm gonna read and I'm gonna say, does it line up? I'm gonna go to some Christians. I'm gonna go to my grace group leader. I'm gonna go to my pastor and I'm gonna ask mature, praying, trusted Christians, can you confirm this? Like, do you feel like this is what God's telling me to do? And this this is art, not science, But for the Christian who has the privilege of the helper making his home in you, we have the privilege of being able to understand over the course of a lifetime the art of learning to listen to the Holy Spirit and follow. The art of being able to figure that out. And the more we do, the more we recognize his voice. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they listen to me. And we can understand that more and we can follow more. And that is one of the most amazing things about being a Christian. Is that I'm not alone. And I have a purpose. And the power of God is in me. And his presence is with me. And I can hear him and I can follow him and I can do life with him. Him And so what I, what I want to ask us to do wherever you're at this weekend is just to take some time to reflect on what that should look like for you. Here's a question I want to ask that you would ask yourself. Where do I need, you personally, where do I need to listen to and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit? Would you even write that question down right now? Because I'm going to give you some time in just a moment to be able to reflect on that question. Where do I need to listen to and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit? Maybe it's in an area you say, I've, I've been resisting forgiveness, and it's just really clear. I put that up on the TV, and you're like, whip, I know, I know exactly where it is. Maybe it's something you need to start doing. Maybe it's something you need to stop doing. Maybe it's an area in your life where you've been way more concerned about like your agenda than God's purpose. Maybe it's an area where you've been trying to move through it with your power instead of saying, I'm gonna rely on and I'm gonna recognize the power of God in my life. But where do you need to listen to and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit? If you're not a Christian and you're hearing this, maybe like many of those of us who are Christians, 
You're at, you're at a place in your life right now where you're going, I, I feel like something's happening and I feel like I'm being pulled or drawn to want to become a Christian and give my life to Christ. Like I don't want to do this on my own anymore. I want what God offers. Many of us who are Christians were there at one moment. And maybe for you the answer is you need to say yes to listen to and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I want us to take some time actually right now to just contemplate that question. And the way that we're gonna do it is we're gonna play a song and we're gonna give you a chance not to sing along but just to listen, to, to let the words help to draw you more to a place of saying I'm, I'm willing and I'm open and I want this, Lord, and to reflect on the question that we've just asked. In what area of my life do I need to listen to and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit? So in a moment, we're gonna do that, but first, would you let me pray? God, I am so thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Where would we be if you weren't with us? Man, we wouldn't have the assurance of salvation that you're there with us. We wouldn't see people coming to Jesus because you wouldn't be there to draw them. Uh, we wouldn't have the reminder that you, you love us and that you're for us. We wouldn't have the understanding that we can have about scripture. But you are here and the helper has made his home in us. Thank you for what that means. Thank you that it means that, that we can surrender to you and what you're leading us to do. Thank you that it means that our, our lives can have purpose and be filled with power. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak right now to each person who is, who is asking you, where do I need to listen to you? Where do I need to follow you? And for everyone right now that's saying, speak to me, God, would you speak? Would you lead? Would you guide? In Jesus' name, amen.